Hello, and welcome to A Week in Watches, episode 24. A Week in Watches is a weekly look back at watch news highlights and uh, cool stories. I'm your host, Zach Weiss, co-founder of Worn and Wound. Thank you for joining me. This week, we have a, a bunch of stories, a few long ones, a few short ones. Um, in fact, there's too much to go over, so I'm just going to get to it. But first, our sponsor. So this week's sponsor is Whatnot a live stream auction app where you can buy and sell unique items as well as connect with other collectors in real time. Stay tuned to later in the show to find out more as well as where to find Wind Up Watch Shop on Whatnot. The watch industry gives itself a pat on the back. The 2022 GPHG Awards have occurred. That is the Grand Prix de Horlogerie de Genève, GPHG. It is a award show, an annual award show that is uh, kind of like the Oscars, but for watches. There's various categories, but unlike other award shows, uh, it, the, the watches aren't kind of chosen at random by a jury, rather brands enter themselves and actually pay a small fee. As such, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting award show because uh, not the entire industry is really represented, but a fair swath of kind of high-end luxury brands do enter. And regardless, it's sort of just like a fun moment of the year where, where the industry celebrates itself. There's a jury of watchmakers, journalists, and celebrity figures that uh, judge this, uh, judge the watches in the various categories. Um, and there's always some interesting characters on the jury. So this year includes uh, George Bamford, uh, who actually will be making an appearance later in this episode as well, from, from Bamford, London. Nick Folks, who was the president of the jury, and he's a historian and author. Uh, Jean-Claude Biver, who needs no introduction, I would think. Uh, Atish Benerjea, who is a tech CEO from Meta, which was interesting to me and surprising. Felix Baumgartner, one of the founders of Urwerk. Aldous Hodge, actor and watchmaker. Wei Ko from Revolution and uh, kind of a known watch personality and many more. So it's this kind of a diverse group of people. Uh, it's an interesting group because there's like CEOs from watch brands voting on other watch brands, but hey, it all seems to work out. Let's look at some winners. Uh, there's been some fun ones this year. So shocking, the watch industry is still a little bit behind the times. So there's both men's and women's categories. And interestingly enough, there's even a subcategory for men's and women's complications. However, this year, both were won by Hermès. In fact, not just by Hermès, but by the Hermès Arco Le Temps Voyageur, which is, in my opinion, totally unisex watch, but happens to be available in two versions, a 38 and, a, and I believe a 41 or 42 millimeter. Uh, one's black and one's blue. They're, like I said, totally unisex, but you know, I'm not a judge here. This was actually my favorite watch from last year's Watches and Wonders. Um, it's a really, really cool, uh, very poetic sort of style of watch. It's sort of like a world timer, but it's really of a travel timer because it doesn't tell you uh, the time around the world at a glance. But what it do is you push a button and a little satellite dial that is within the dial will jump and there's a little pointer that points at the city that you're then looking at and the hour hand will move over. It's just incredibly cool. Uh, really like took my breath away when I saw it. This year, the diver category went to Tudor Pelagos FXD. Uh, Tudor seems to win something every year. So, you know, it was a shoe in, I believe. It was up against Breitling, Tag Heuer, uh, a Grand Seiko, a Doxa Army. I think they were all solid choices. Um, the Pelagos FXD though, I would say kind of was, was a bit of a special release last year when it, when it happened. Definitely got a, got a quite the reaction. There's the challenge category, which is sort of the more affordable entry, a little bit quirkier. Um, that's the one where I feel like we would, might see at some point some brands you're more familiar with. And this year was won by the Mad One Red Edition, which is the fidget spinner meets exotic watch by the minds at MBNF, but it's powered by a uh, Miyota 9015 movement. It was in the $3,000-ish range, but basically impossible to buy. You had to enter a lottery to get them. Um, they are out there though. Uh, there's even one in the office. Um, it's a fun watch. Um, I, this one was a little bit bizarre that it won, to be honest. You know, I think uh, while I appreciate the watch and what it does, I'm not sure that if MBNF wasn't attached to it, if it would get quite the same reaction that it did. The Petite Aiguille Award, which uh, is, is a funny award. It's sort of like above the challenge in terms of price point. So it's like, I believe a four to 10K price range was won by Trilobe, which is an interesting French indie brand that has a, a Swiss made watch with an in-house movement. Um, the watch that won was called the Nuit Fantastique Dune Edition. It's a very pretty watch that uses uh, discs to tell the time in sort of an irregular uh, way. So there's 
uh, two apertures on the dial, one for seconds, one for minutes. Then there's an outer ring around the dial which is the hour indicator. So no hands and nothing really pointing to like explicitly at the time either. It's sort of, you know, it's not a great like hyper accurate watch, but it's more of a poetic passing of the day sort of a thing. That one won against uh, Louis Arard and Grand Seiko as well as some others. That said, Grand Seiko did make it home with, a, with an award and a big one at that. They took home the chronometry prize and they did so with the Grand Seiko Kodo Constant Force Tourbillon, which is an absolutely epic watch that was also released around Watches and Wonders this year. We actually uh, had quite a bit of hands-on time in Switzerland when that came out. We have some video where we talked about with Joe Kirk, which I recommend checking out. It's a Constant Force Escapement and Tourbillon that's on the same axis. I believe it's the only watch uh, that is like that. Um, it features a Remontor system, so in addition, it has a deadbeat seconds. Uh, but because of how it works with the tourbillon cage and the uh, Remontor, it actually has a very unique um, auditory quality to it, where it like, sort of like ticks, like tick, 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 tick. It's very cool. Uh, the designer who made it famously was once uh, was a professional guitarist before he was a watchmaker. The Agui de Or which is the gold prize, the big kahuna of the event, went to none other than, once again, MBNF for their Legacy Machine Sequential EVO. And this is, uh, this is totally legit. Definitely one of the most epic watches that has come out this year. It's MBNF at their most MBNF, mixing whimsy and mechanical wonderment uh, like no other. Um, it's a chronograph, actually two chronographs mirrored side by side. You can control them independently. You can control them at the same time. Uh, yet there's only one escapement. And because it's a legacy machine, the balance wheel is floating above the whole dial. But this is also one of their Evo cases. So it actually is meant to be quite sporty and apparently rugged, even though it looks like it would break quite easily. It's a six figure watch. I don't recommend trying to break it, but all these brands and many more got to take home uh, tiny little golden baby arms, which is what the award looks like. It's not actually a baby arm, but it's, it's a kind of strange looking award as well as some respect from the watch industry. What do you think of the GPHD? What watches would you like to have seen entered? And thinking about next year, although that's obviously a little soon, is anything stand out to you that you'd like to see win? All right, next, the Brits go off-road. Uh, this is a, a, a cool collab I didn't expect to see, but it was, I still think it was pretty exciting. And it's from two British brands. So this is where Bamford pops up his head once again. So George Bamford of Bamford London, uh, you know, originally watch modder of like the super high-end watches and has then subsequently become more of a independent watch brand in its own right. It's collaborated with Land Rover, the maker of iconic off-road vehicles. They created a Land Rover designed limited edition that is inspired by the Defender, which uh, arguably the coolest Land Rover if you ask me, but don't ask me. Uh, it's a 40 millimeter titanium sport watch. There we go, titanium once again, with a matching gray dial, a sandwich design with a loom on a you know plate underneath, but it's all gray, it's all tone on tone. Something that sets this dial a little bit apart is that at three, six, and nine are sort of wide arcs that uh, just give it kind of a cool look to it. But something that's quite different about this is that it also features fixed lugs, uh, are really like sort of slots through the case rather than traditional lugs and spring bars, which will fit 18 millimeter straps. The watch sort of looks to me like a cross between a Unimatic and a Cedric Bellon, which is a brand that is um, available through Watch Angels, worth checking out. These are all powered by Salita SW200 automatics. Uh, it's a limited edition of 100 units and they cost 1,000 25 uh, British pounds, which I'm not sure that could include VAT. Uh, I couldn't quite tell from their website. That's around 1300 USD. And now a bit about this week's sponsor, Whatnot. Imagine a mix between social media and a live marketplace. That's what the Whatnot app is like. You can find anything you might collect from sneakers to playing cards to of course watches being auctioned and sold live. Watch the auctions, chat with the hosts and other viewers, bid and buy at your discretion all within the single app. We're excited to announce that Wind Up Watch Up is joining in on the fun with our first stream happening Tuesday, November 22nd at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Our very own Patrick Marlett will be hosting and he'll be looking at and discussing various products from the shop, including Zodiac Blueberry GMTs, 
adapt series one watches and more all of which will be purchasable at the time additionally we'll be giving away one of each of the brand new timex x worn and wound ww75 limited editions which are quickly selling out to check that out download the whatnot app you'll actually get 15 dollars in credit towards your first purchase if you use the invite link in the description and bookmark the upcoming stream we hope to see you there Masena doubles down on type 20s uh, Masena Lab is becoming a bit of a fixture here. I feel like I've talked about them quite a lot over the last few weeks and episodes, but they just keep dropping cool watches, so I guess we'll just keep doing it. They announced a collaboration with Mathe Tissot, which is a, a historical watch brand that got revived, I don't know, maybe sometime in the last five, six years, something like that. And this collaboration is in the style of two Type 20 watches. So there's actually two watches in this collaboration. And this is, the story gets a bit confusing here. So the watch is actually based on a Breguet Big Eye Type 20 uh, that was created in 1954 when they won the French MOD contract to create the pilot's chronograph. However, Breguet did not make these watches. Mathe Tissot did. They are branded Breguet, however. But you can also find vintage Type 20s with Mathe Tissot on the dial. So this is how it kind of all works uh, together. Like Mathe Tissot really does have a, you know, a legitimate uh, provenance with this watch. For this collaboration, they made two versions. So there's the Type 20 flyback chronograph, which uh, has a flyback mechanism on the chronograph, which is an instant reset without stopping. And that was actually a requirement for the original Type 20s as per the MOD. This features an Arola 7750 movement, which is uh, not a brand I was familiar with, but it is, from what I can tell, a modified Valju 7750 to have that flyback function. It has a black dial with um, oversized faux vintage new numerals, uh, giving it a, a really actually quite nice look. There's only 25 of these watches, however, and they cost 2,995, which actually really isn't that bad. Flyback chronographs are, are quite uncommon. So, you know, I think you're not gonna find a mechanical chronograph really for much less than that, at least new. The second watch is called the Tribute to the Type 20. This one features a manual wound Solita SW511. It's not a flyback, however, and it has a tropical dial. So like a brown dial with smaller numerals. And this one is actually meant to look like William Messina, founder of Messina Lab's own uh, vintage Breguet Type 20, which uh, he, he has and wears and puts up on his Instagram. It's quite a beautiful piece. There are 99 of these watches and they run $1,995. Both are 38.5 millimeters, feature bi-directional no-click bezels uh, and come with bun straps as well as a second uh, two-piece leather strap. Now it's possible by the time you're watching this that it is already sold out as those numbers are pretty low and Messina Lab watches tend to sell pretty quickly. So if so, uh, there's another brand called Hemel, a micro brand that actually did a very similar project recently, also with Mathe Tissot, also based on their Type 20. This one's co-branded with Hemel. And that one is available for $1,799 while supplies last. So check that out as well. It looks a little bit different than the uh, Messina ones, but um, still a very cool project. Squally goes Super Squally. Squale uh, is the, one of the unsung heroes of dive watches. They've been around for a long time, since uh, 1959. And they're kind of famous for originally having been a producer of high-spec cases for other brands, uh, which included Blancpain and Doxa. Um, I believe Alec and Waj as well, but that might not be uh, correct. These days, however, they just make well-priced Swiss dive watches with uh, fantastic specs and great history. Uh, but they tend to go under the radar. They're kind of just one of those brands that doesn't make a ton of noise, so they get sort of forgotten. But watches like their 1521, which is a 500 meter Swiss made automatic dive watch for around $1,000 is, you know, this fantastic value that honestly you should just look at. This week, however, they announced the Super Squale, which is a new line based on a watch from the 60s. Squale does not launch things very often, particularly new lines. They sometimes do collabs, they sometimes do new colors, but whole new lines is really quite rare. So for us Squale fans, this is pretty big news. This one has a classic 60s skin diver style to it. Uh, apparently super means skin diver, where pro in the Squale world means more high spec um, kind of a thing. This one is 38 millimeters by 45 millimeters and it's 200 meter diver. So less than a lot of their other watches, which are really kind of high depth uh, divers and features a squared off lug. So you can imagine other watches from the same period, uh, Seiko 62 Moss, uh, you know, things like what, you know, the, the glass shoot original CQ is based on Walbrook Douglas. There's, there's a lot of watches out there with this sort of 
classic 60s skin diver case. It's a bit generic, but it is a stylish and time specific design. And well, Squally made it back in the day, so they have the right to continue. There are two dial versions, one more vintage and one more modern. The vintage one features large lumps of loom um, and applied markers at the cardinal points. There's a black or a sunray gray version with a steel bezel, which is my personal favorite of the of the bunch. And then there's a sort of a military-ish dial with uh, numerals at 12, 3, 6, and 9, which sort of has a touch of a 50 fathoms look and it's more modern, but it's not overtly modern either. And that one comes in black or blue. These watches go on sale December 1st, starting at 1060 USD. And now it's time for the release of the week. Corono Tokyo unveils a new chronograph. Uh, Corono Tokyo is the highly collectible Japanese micro brand that was founded by Hajime Asayoka. Um, who has another brand, a high-end independent brand under his own name, where he makes, you know, beautiful bespoke watches that cost uh, tons of money and uh, have long, long wait lists. So created uh, this other brand is another sort of expression of his craft that are uh, more affordable and more available, though still kind of hard to get, but we'll get to that later. With Corona, uh, you have a unique chance to own a watch designed by Hajime. Um, they are very unique and refined. Uh, they also focus on all Japanese like craft and movements, so they feature Miyota and Seiko movements. Um, they're a bit expensive, potentially for what they are, but they're very well finished and they're very exclusive. They are hard to get. They tend to launch in drops, uh, very small productions, and they're easy to miss out on. Afterwards, they go for above retail, but the brand actually does discourage uh, flipping their watches. And I think they keep an eye on that kind of thing. So within the collection, there are uh, a few series. There's the classic series, which are three handers with a unique sort of art deco design. There's the Grand series, which are also three-handers, which feature Arushi lacquer dials, so a bit more exotic and a bit more craft-focused. And then there's the Complication series, which features mostly chronographs, but then also one triple date that powered that is powered by a Miyota movement as well. The chronographs have always stood out to me. Uh, they have this beautiful Art Deco sector design. There's nothing else that looks quite like them. Um, the chronograph two in white is a personal favorite and Zach Kazan has one and I am currently wearing it. I borrowed it for this shoot. I mean, just look at this thing. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's powered by the Seiko NE86 automatic chronograph, which is also very underused and underappreciated movement. It's a 28,800 beats per hour column wheel vertical clutch uh, chronograph that uses Seiko's magic lever winding and triple hammer chronograph actuation. So it's really a fantastic movement that, like I said, is just sort of underused uh, by brands. So it's great to see them feature it here. So here's the news part. Uh, Corono has announced the Chronograph 1 Mark II. Do you ever see a watch and just stop in your tracks and say, wow, that's beautiful? That's what happened to me when I saw this uh, today uh, come through on Instagram. It's a new design with um, similarities with the older models, such as the one I'm wearing here. The dial is a stunning sort of matte, but lightly textured uh, rose gold, as they call it, but that's sort of a, you know, a salmon quality to it. Uh, and it has black subdials. There's just something about the mix of black and gold that um, I find just endlessly appealing. It's a bit simplified. Uh, there's less scales and circles, so it's a cleaner and more open dial. You can see from this one, it is a bit uh, uh, complicated and busy. Uh, I think it has a unique charm to it, but they sort of opened it up for this new one. It also features a large applied and polished 12 marker, which uh, apparently, according to their website, signifies that this is a new generation of the chronograph. But more importantly, the case got a bit of an overhaul. So it's still uh, 38 millimeters like this model, and it has this uh, cool rounded case design, which actually makes it wear a little bit smaller. Um, and as you can see, this one, it has uh, it's not like a flat sided watch. It, it sort of curves around, but it's a bit thick. That's like sort of the common sort of complaint about this watch. And as you can maybe see, the metal almost looks like it's like a molten metal that's sort of resting on your wrist. And it's a bit unrefined at the bottom edge. So for the new one, they've changed it to a different three piece construction that has thinned out this mid case. So the center actually sort of ends where that lug uh, comes and connects with it. This, according to their website, gives it a 30% thinner visual impression. 
I'm not sure how you calculate that, but when you look at the photo, it definitely looks much thinner. So that case measures 11.7 millimeters thick without the crystal or 13.5 millimeters with the crystal, whereas this one is 13.9 with the crystal. So an overall change of 0.4 millimeters, which is not insignificant, but not huge either, but it's more of a visual change because of how the case is actually broken up. So it should wear less chunky and I think probably look a little bit more refined. So how do you get it? The watch launches at 11 p.m. Japan time, Thursday, November 24th. That's 9 a.m. in New York City, where we are based. As to where you are, just, you know, figure that out <laughs> on your own. The watch costs US 3,460. Uh, shipping and taxes might not be included there. I wasn't 100% sure. There are only hundreds being made. They didn't specify the exact number, but likely thousands of people who want them. So if you are interested in it, Make sure you have an account pre-made before the time of signing up because that'll help you with your transaction. Have your info all set up. Kick your kids off the internet so you have, uh, you know, full bandwidth. And for the very first time, at least it is happening after this episode airs. So, you know, you have some fair warning. Deliveries for the Chronograph 1 Mark II start around Christmas of 2022 and will continue through February 23. So not too long of a wait period either. Um, best of luck to those of you who want to get it, and should you land one, let us know. And that's it for this episode of A Week in Watches. Uh, we want to thank our sponsor, once again, Whatnot, and be sure to tune in to the Whatnot app November 22nd at 4 p.m. Eastern Time for the Wind Up Watch Shop stream. If this episode has been entertaining uh, or informative, please do like and subscribe uh, or rate on if you're listening to it on a podcast format. We do appreciate that. And don't forget to visit warnandwound.com daily to stay up to date on watch news and reviews. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.